Well, we're going to read God's word now, and um, we read from 1 John chapter 2. I'll begin at verses verse 7 and read through into verse 20. It's there up on the screen for you to read. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. So verses 18 to 20 is where we're going to be uh, this morning. And John has been writing to assure the people. He wants to give them confidence in their faith. He wants them to know that they know the Lord. And he's showing them how they can discern a true Christian from a false believer. Now, he writes in this way, not to unsettle them, but to assure them. And as we saw last week, he gave a very strong challenge that we're not to love the world or the things in the world. If we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. And the world is passing and empty and will one day end. And so the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the proud, proudful boasting of life. This is direct, challenging preaching. Well, praise God for that. We, we need to hear such truths. Now in verse 18, uh, John continues with the, the tests of what a true Christian looks like. It's a bit like a spiritual MOT, I suppose. Uh, what does a true believer look like? And it's clear in context what is happening in the congregations that he's writing to is that uh, there are some that have left the church. They have disfellowshipped themselves from local churches. And they have left the church not over some minor disagreement, but because they have fundamentally rejected the truth concerning Jesus. So they've heard the biblical truth of who Jesus is and why he's come, 
and they didn't like what they heard. And so they left the church. They deselected themselves from membership within local congregations. And you can imagine that this would have a, an unsettling effect on those who remained faithful within the congregations. These are, are people that would have worshipped with congregations, maybe even had leadership roles within congregations, and they have left. And John is wanting to bring reassurance, and he's wanting to demonstrate what's going on with these people who have left churches. Uh, they haven't left over some issue of the colour of the carpet, or uh, they've heard Apollos down the road and they prefer his preaching to what they are having. Uh, th this is something far more serious. It concerns the truth of Jesus. And, and John wants us to understand that our view of the Lord Jesus is reflected in our view of the church. The two go together. And he wants us to see that fundamentally fellowship is rooted in the truth of who Jesus is. And these verses we are looking at now, they're on the screen. Let me outline where we're going to go this morning in. Verse 18, John is going to tell us that we are living in the last hour or the last days. He then goes on to explain that true believers cannot fall away, but false believers will fall away. Verse 19, and then in verse 20, he talks about the work of the Holy Spirit, the anointing that every believer has in the Holy Spirit. Well, let's uh, work our way through these main points then. Live your Christian life in the light of the lateness of the hour. Be alert and be on your guard. This is John's message. Children, he's writing as a spiritual father to these children. And he says something very striking. It is the last hour. And you've heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. John is showing us a spiritual map, a spiritual GPS. And he's been very clear, very direct. Children, it is the last hour. And there's a very clear indication that it is the last hour, that Antichrist or the spirit of Antichrist will be at work. And what does John mean by the last hour and what does he mean by Antichrist? Well, let me explain that to you. Firstly then, what does John mean by the last hour? Well, we know our Bibles, don't we? We know that God had promised in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, that his Son would come, that the Messiah would come and he would be saviour of his people. And so everything in the Old Testament is pointing forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus. All the animal sacrifices, the temple imagery, the priesthood, the law, it's all pointing to the ultimate fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And praise God, the Lord Jesus has come. He's fulfilled all that was required. He lived that perfect life. He obeyed his heavenly Father. He taught God's words, did God's works, lived a perfect life, went to the cross, died as a substitute for those who will trust in him, rose again the third day, ascended back to heaven. And John would want us to understand, and the rest of the Bible would want us to understand, that the last hour or the last days, however it's defined, is this period of Jesus' ascension back 
to heaven at God's right hand and where we are now. So it's literally true that believers 2,000 years ago, this side of the cross, resurrection and ascension, were living in the last hour. And equally so, we are too. So what this language means is that the next great event in God's redemptive calendar is what? It is the glorious, visible return of the Lord Jesus in glory and judgment. That's where this world is heading. This is where time is going to focus. So the New Testament, when it refers to the last hour, the last days, is not referring to that period of time that commenced in 1948 and will extend just for a few more years where Jesus sets up a visible reign uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem. It's referring to the, the fullness of time that exists between the first coming of Jesus and his return. And that return could be today. The skies could be ripped open and we will not see death, but we will see Jesus. Wouldn't that be a wonderful Lord's Day, the best Lord's Day, wouldn't it? So we are at the very edge of the conclusion of God's purposes. The next great event in God's glorious plan is the return of Jesus. He is coming. Jesus is going to return. So are you ready this morning? Jesus came back right now. Would, would you be ready? Jesus came back today and you were not in him. Tomorrow you would be in hell. That's the urgency. That's the dramatic consequence of these words that John is talking about. Jesus himself said, work for the night is coming when no man can work. The opportunity to press into the kingdom of God, to honour the Lord Jesus Christ, to live to his glory. It's now, today, we've been given this day. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but live to the glory of Jesus. Live in the light that it is the last hour. And we know, don't we, that it's the last hour. John tells us it's the last hour. We know it because, verse 18, what does he say? As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, and so many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it is the last hour. So John is saying these people would have heard the warnings. The Old Testament scriptures actually warned of, a, of an antichrist, an anti-messiah. And you can read, for example, Daniel 7 through to 9, where, where these things are explained in, in detail. You've heard that antichrist is coming. That's what John is drawing on, the, the Old Testament, and maybe his own apostolic warnings. One of the jobs of the apostles in uh, the early church was to warn the congregation against false teaching and, and against those who would oppose the Lord Jesus. And of course it raises up so many questions in our mind, doesn't it, this term Antichrist? I, I'm going to disappoint you really, I'm not going to answer many of your questions, I'm just going to stick to what John says here uh, is it going to be one person right at the end of history? Is it going to be a person who attempts to pretend that Jesus has come again? Is it going to be some form of worldly tyranny raised up against the people of God? These are all questions I'm sure that rise in your minds when we talk about Antichrist. But that's not John's point here. So the point I want to bring to you this morning is that this congregation that John is writing to is being warned against the spirit of Antichrist in the local congregations. Those who would teach another gospel, a different Jesus. 
They're to be warned and alert and aware they are in the last hour and these things will happen. For example, back in 2003, Dan Brown published his best-selling novel, uh, The Da Vinci Code. It was a gripping bestseller made into a Hollywood film with Tom Hanks in the lead role. It was a work of pure historical fiction. And yet it was amazing to see how many people wanted to take what was written in this novel and treat it as historical fact. And yet the Jesus presented in that novel uh, has no reflection to the glorious Lord Jesus presented in the scriptures. The, there were blasphemous things said about him in that book. And someone who would want to believe in that kind of Jesus, as opposed to the Jesus of the Bible, is an example of the principle of Antichrist at work. You see, anything that is opposed to Jesus is the spirit of Antichrist. And we need to pay very careful attention to what is being taught to us about the Lord Jesus and the way of salvation in him. Because if we go wrong there, we go fundamentally wrong on the central tenets of our faith. And of course, this is a self-application to my preaching. When I'm teaching you about the Lord Jesus, you should, I would, I would hope you're paying attention to the, all of the preaching, but particularly when the Lord Jesus Christ is being focused on and the way of salvation is being presented, connected to him, you need particular discernment. You need to be particularly aware at these points. And John is saying there are many antichrists that have already come. He's saying within the local congregation, um, there are those who will seek to teach a different Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 19, which we'll come to very briefly, uh, these false teachers, these who have the spirit of Antichrist, they have left the fellowship. They've gone th their own way. And John will explain why that was. And he's saying, look, because of the influence of others who will deny the, the greatness and glory and sufficiency of Jesus, Antichrist is at work, the spirit of Antichrist is at work, and you know that you're in the last hour. And so he's saying, be aware of where you are in God's redemptive plan and purpose. Don't be unwatchful. Don't be unguarded. It's the last hour. And if we're in the last hour, false teachers will, will come. False Christ will arise. False teaching uh, will be multiplied. And so we need to be aware of where we are in God's great calendar. John Calvin's got a great quote. Let us consider this settled, that no one who has made progress in the school of Christ, who does not joyfully await the day of death and final resurrection, let us not hesitate to await the Lord's coming, not only with longing, but also with groaning and sighs as the happiest thing of all. He will come to us. He will come to us as Redeemer. You know, our great hope is not, this is going to sound strange, it's not to die and to be with Jesus, although that is far better. And each one of us, if we were with Jesus now, would not want to come back to this broken, corrupt, painful, sinful world. We'd want to spend forever with him in uh, that state. But it's not our final great hope. Our final great hope is to be with Jesus, but to be with him in a, a new resurrection body. To see him face to face. 
to see the great shepherd of our souls wiping away every tear from our eyes and leading us to those living waters and being there in that new heavens and that new earth. To have a resurrection body with Jesus, ever being with him in his presence. That's at the end of the last hour. That's the next great hope that we have. Either we, we die or, and go to be with Jesus, or Jesus comes before we die and we meet him in the air and we're immediately transformed and glorified in new resurrection bodies. So I long to be where the praise is never ending, yearn to dwell where the glory never fades, where countless worshippers will share one song and cries of worthy will honour the Lamb. That's what we are looking for. That's what the end of the last hour means. But between now and then, we need to be watchful and we need to be on our guard because the spirit of Antichrist is evidently at work. But the next great event in history is the return of Jesus. It's as if the sun is just going to break above the horizon. And the day is going to dawn. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the if you've ever seen Dawn, you, you, you should. It's a, a glorious, wonderful um, experience to see the sun rise. I remember being in, um, in Galilee and getting up early one morning and just seeing the sun rise across the Sea of Galilee. It was absolutely beautiful. Uh, but there were hints just before the sun came above the, the hills that dawn was about to break. And that's where we are. Dawn is about to break. And so, look ahead in glory, but also be watchful. Be on your guard. The spirit of Antichrist is at work. See the lateness of the hour. Anticipate that assaults will be made on the person and work of Jesus, on the truth of God and on the truth of the gospel. So, live in the light of the fact that we are in the last hour. But secondly, true believers cannot fall away from the faith, but false believers not only can, but do. So look at verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all are not of us. So do you see John's point here? These false teachers had tried to lead others astray. Some of them had received the truth of Jesus and didn't like it, and didn't want to hear it. And so what do they do? They leave the fellowship. And Note what John says. He doesn't say that these were true believers and they didn't persevere. He doesn't say that they had all the gifts of God except perseverance and so they fell away. No, his fundamental message in verse 19 is that these who'd left the church over the clear apostolic truth concerning Jesus, they were not saved in the first place. They reveal by their actions, by their view of Jesus, by their view of the truth presented of Jesus in the local church, they've rejected that and they've left the church. Now, of course, there are valid reasons to leave a church when there is error being taught and when a false gospel is being presented, uh, when there is... Uh, sinful leadership and injustice and uh, heavy shepherding. There, there are a number of, of reasons. Uh, but this is not that. This is something different. These people are showing their true colors. They belonged to Bible-teaching, Christ-loving churches, apostolic churches, 
and then chose to leave. And in leaving those kinds of churches, they revealed who they were, that they were not genuinely believers. Because here's the great point. The sheep love to hear the shepherd's voice and follow him, and he knows them. So the true sheep are attracted to where the shepherd's voice is heard. And where is the shepherd's voice heard today? In the faithful opening up of the scriptures. John says, yes, these people left. They left the congregation. And it must be raising some concerns, some some doubts with those who remain. Well, can you lose your salvation? Can you apostatize from true faith? Can you be a true Christian and and lose that? John's response is, yes, these people, they were part of you. Now they've left. They professed faith in Christ. Maybe they were part of the fellowship. Maybe they met around the Lord's table with you. Maybe some of them you've seen baptized. And yet their departure it's very clear that they are rejecting Christ. And they are rejecting Christ because they'd never truly come to him in the first place. These were false believers who now reveal their true colors. You know, there would have been believers in that congregation wondering, well, how can this be? I've... I've had fellowship with these people. I've got alongside them. They've been my friends. They've been in my homes. We've eaten meals together. We've talked about doctrine together. We've worked together. They seem to trust in Christ even in difficult times. Yet they've left the church. They've rejected Christ. Is there something wrong? You can see why the church could be greatly unsettled by people leaving. And John says, yes, there's something wrong, but it's not with you, believer, sitting in this local church that I'm writing to. The problem is with those who've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a problem with the promise of God. It's not with God's salvation. It's not with assurance or perseverance. The problem is they never truly believed. You see, true believers cannot fall away, and that's greatly reassuring to the youngest person here. If you believe in Jesus, Jesus will will keep you and never let you go. And those of us who are older and more mature in the faith Um, Perhaps some of us are reaching the end of our journey. We can say, all the way my Saviour leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? True believers cannot fall away, but false believers must. John is saying that they are disfellowshipping themselves shows the state of their hearts. So something I've already said, but it's worth repeating, is our view of Jesus is reflected in our view and commitment to a church where the name of Jesus is proclaimed and the truth of the gospel faithfully explained. They, these people, they pretended to know grace. They professed to receive grace, but they never had it. And so John gives a challenging word here, but it's also an encouraging word because it diagnoses a potential barrier to these people going on with the Lord. If these people are falling away, then I may fall away. But John is saying they left. They rejected the truth of Jesus because they'd never really come to him in the first place. And then to reinforce what he said, 
Third point, all true believers are anointed with, indwelt by the Holy Spirit who makes Jesus real and known to us. Verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. So, isn't it wonderful, dear believer, that the Holy Spirit has been given to us? You have the Holy Spirit. You cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit of truth. And he seals the truth to our hearts. The truth connected to the Lord Jesus. It is through the Holy Spirit that we know Jesus and his truth and grow in that truth ourselves. So you have an anointing from the Holy One. You know, there are false teachers in John's day, in our day, they claim this special anointing. You can see them on the internet, can't you? They are anointed people and their ministry is an, an anointed ministry and the place that they speak is an, an anointed place. And this is what was going on in the situation with these false teachers. They were claiming extra um, secret knowledge that they truly were the anointed ones and if People would join with them. They could be initiated into the, the secrets that they knew. And John is saying, no, if you're a true believer, you are anointed with the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit dwells in your hearts and he makes Jesus known. Remember in uh, Ephesians 3 verses 14 through to 16, Paul Paul's great prayer for the Ephesian church that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Strengthening of the spirit is connected to the indwelling of Christ. You can't have one without the other. So every believer Every believer here this morning is anointed by the Holy Spirit. And receiving the Spirit and the anointing of God is not something that happens after you come to the Lord Jesus. It's not a, a second higher step into a secret knowledge. The work of the Holy Spirit is happening this morning as we receive God's word as we seek to apply it and as we seek to know Jesus, the Spirit is shining that spotlight on the glorious person of the Lord Jesus and we, we grow because the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. And the Spirit of truth helps us discern right from wrong. There are people here this morning that were part of churches where false teaching was taught. And there was something in you when you heard something wrong that stirred in your heart and in your mind. You went to the scriptures and you understood what was going on. And you had discernment and you searched the scriptures and you were brought to the truth. And that's the working of the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, you have this anointing the Holy Spirit is giving as a guarantee and a deposit for a greater redemptive works to come. Ephesians 1, chapter 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, sorry. The Holy Spirit is the seal. He's the anointing of God. He's the one who makes Jesus known. John is confronting directly these super elite false teachers who were claiming anointing and he's saying, no, you don't have the anointing. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon every true believer. I've written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no 
lie is of the truth. In other words, John is saying, I'm not bringing you some, some new truth. I'm just reinforcing what you've already heard. I'm bringing to you the, the truth concerning Jesus. You are to have confidence in the Savior. You are to have fellowship with other believers around the truth of Jesus and the Holy Spirit will seal those things to your lives because he's at work in your life. So fellowship in the local church is fundamentally that which the Spirit produces as the truth and reality of Jesus is believed, accepted and outworked within our fellowship together. That's what creates Christian fellowship. Unity in the truth, centered on the Lord Jesus, worked out through the Holy Spirit, empowering us to live in a consistent way to what we've heard. And so you can see what John is doing here in conclusion, can't you? He's warning the fellowship. He's calling us to live in the light of where we are in God's great plan and purpose. It is the last hour. Then he's forcing us to be aware of the, the danger of false teaching, the spirit of Antichrist that's at work. To be discerning and, and wise and careful with what we hear. And then the assurance that, well, those who left these faithful churches, they left not with a problem with the gospel or with the Lord Jesus, but because they never came to him in the first place. And then this further reassurance that we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, who will lead and guide us into all truth. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God, your words are rich, even when they are challenging and direct. Grant us truth and light from your word and by your spirit, enable us to walk in it and have assurance in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that we look to that great day of the Lord Jesus. It is the last hour. May we live in the light of that truth and wait for his glorious appearing. In his name we pray. Amen.